The Buddha once said that if you look back at your life, or your many lifetimes, you wouldn't be able to find a point that's where you could say, before this there was no ignorance, and then ignorance began. We're all coming from ignorance. Which in technical terms means that we're coming from a position where we don't really see the Four Noble Truths. We don't see our life in terms of the Four Noble Truths. We have our own terms, our narratives of who we are, our beliefs about the world, all kinds of knowledge and theories that actually get in the way of looking at where there's stress and suffering, what's causing it and what we can do to put an end to it. So ignorance is not just a lack of knowing. Sometimes it's different kinds of knowledge. But knowledge that doesn't look at things in terms that will actually put an end to suffering. It's when we begin to realize that our knowledge isn't working. That's the beginning of true knowledge. As the Buddha once said, if you recognize your own foolishness, that's the beginning of wisdom. To that extent, you're wise. Regardless of how much you may know, if you realize this is not putting an end to suffering and there must be some better way of looking at things, that's the beginning of wisdom. And you can cut through your ignorance by learning to look at things as they happen simply as events, whether the things outside of you or things actually in your own mind, in your own body. But the Buddha says, practice looking at these things simply as things that are separate. You see your body as something separate, your feelings as something separate, your perceptions, your thought constructs. Even your sensory consciousness, you have to see that as something separate. separate both in the sense of that these are individual events that arise and pass away. And they're separate from your awareness, your sense of you. You want to pare back your sense of you, because as long as you claim something to be you or yours, you can't really see it clearly. There's bound to be a liking or disliking or holding on that prevents you from seeing when something arises exactly why does it, you know, does it arise, and what effects does it carry in its train. This is why the beginning of meditation starts with simply looking at the body in and of itself, simply as a body, or feelings in and of themselves mind states in and of themselves, mental qualities in and of themselves, simply as events that are happening, something separate from your awareness of them. So you begin to see how they fit into that causal pattern that either leads to suffering or leads away from suffering. In other words, we take our experience and take it outside of its ordinary context i.e. our narratives about who we are and how we interact with other people, or our views about the world as a whole. One of the interesting things about the Buddhist teachings on the Four Noble Truths are on dependent core arising, long list of causes and effects, but it's not placed inside a context. Who is this happening to? The Buddha says, don't ask. Is there nobody there? Don't ask. Is there somebody there? Don't ask. Do these things exist or not exist? Don't ask. Just look at them as events arising and passing away.
which means that we have to learn how to get our minds out of their ordinary context, where we have a view of the world, and based on that view of the world we sort everything else out in those terms. The Buddha wants us to erase that context so we can just see things as they arise, as they pass away, and how they influence one another, simply as events that you can watch in the present moment. So in that sense, while we're meditating, we like to get our minds outside of their normal context. But in order to get the mind outside of that context requires a certain kind of context as well. Because when the Buddha talks about the ability to put the mind in this position, we are seeing things arising and passing away. requires a whole other series of aids in the practice, many of which are not just meditation techniques, but they go back through the way you act in your day-to-day -day life, what you listen to and give credence to, what you respect, and the people you hang around with. These things help put the mind in the right context where it can then drop the context. For example, the Buddha talks about how it's necessary to have right conduct both in body, speech, and mind. That's why we have the precepts. Because if you don't hold by the precepts, it's hard to be really honest about what your actions are and what their results are. If you've been harmful to other people, you don't like to think about it. And as we all know what happens, either you think about how you've been harmful and you start getting remorseful and depressed, or you start going into denial. You didn't really hurt them or they don't really matter, that kind of thinking, which makes it difficult for, think for you to see things as they actually arise and pass away. So the precepts in here are support or meditation practice. And we listen to the Dharma as a support for our precepts to keep us on the right path. And in listening to the Dharma, we have to associate with what they call admirable friends, people who exemplify the Dharma in their activities and their actions, both because it's hard to listen to the Dharma and believe it if you see that the person who is teaching the Dharma is not abiding by the Dharma. And secondly, it's because there's more to the Dharma than just words. There are habits, attitudes that can't be put into words but can be sensed. You pick them up just by hanging around a person. And so there is this social context for the Dharma social context for the practice that puts an end to ignorance, a social context for the ability to develop a mind state that goes beyond the social context. So as you're practicing, there are two things you want to keep in mind. One is your ability to make the mind strong enough so it can meditate in any context. And two, to make sure that you're creating the right social context, both for yourself and for the other people who are here. Because ideally, we're here to be admirable friends to one another, to be exemplary in our conduct. We don't have, have to teach one another the Dharma. In fact, it makes life a lot more difficult for me if you're out there teaching each other. It's like that man I met from the Yukon. He said if he's out in the forest and he encounters a bear, he's a lot more comfortable if he's the only person there. If there's another person or two other, three other people, he finds it more and more difficult to read the bear. So you don't have to be teaching the Dharma to one another, but in your actions you should be ex examples of the Dharma to one another. It makes it a lot easier for us to practice together. So 
starts with simple things like showing respect for the, the place we have here. We're living off of other people's generosity as we live here. So I just want to keep that in mind. I've been told that over the past week or so people have been very careless about leaving lights on. You may have noticed the generator gets turned on every morning automatically when the batteries go too low. Solar electricity is essentially free, but when we use too much of it, then we have to generate electricity. It's simple things like that, showing respect for the situation around us, showing respect for the things that people have provided for us so we can practice. It starts there and it builds up. When you talk with one another, try to be frugal in your words. Remember, each of us is here to learn how to develop quietude. And if your speech is going to disturb someone else's quietude, you want to make sure there's a good reason for it. And John Fung always used to say, before you say anything, if you're going to want your words to help in the practice, ask yourself, is this really necessary? If it's not, you don't have to say it. And as we do the little things going through the day where we can help one another. If you see there's slack someplace, well, you take up the slack. We're operating on a voluntary system here, what they call an economy of gifts. Which means that some things get done, some things don't get done. You see there's something that's not getting done and you, you're in a position to do it, go ahead. Something's not clean, something's not in order. We're not here serving anybody. We're here developing good qualities of our mind. In this way our mutual presence becomes admirable friendship, which helps us in the practice. On the one hand, you want to help create an ideal environment for the practice. And then use that environment to strengthen the mind. So ultimately it doesn't have to depend on a particular environment, a particular context. You can meditate anywhere. Regardless of the situation. This is a really necessary quality of mind, because life is uncertain. You can't always guarantee that the, this place will con continue to be as quiet and as conducive as it is right now. We can't always guarantee that we will stay here. Some of us have to go. Some of us are thinking we're going to stay, but who knows what happens is going to happen. So you want to work on that quality of mind that can drop the context. Like as you're sitting here right now. John Lee used to say, don't think that you're sitting here in a meditation hall. Think that you're sitting wide, way out in the wide open, all alone. There's nobody around for you to worry about. Simply you and the breath, you and the body. And as you focus on the breath and focus on the body, that sense of you who's there is going to get pared away. As you begin to recognize more and more the factors of mind that keep you with the breath, keep you with the body, and the factors of mind that pull you away. If there's anything that pulls you away, learn how not to identify with it. No matter how intriguing it may seem, no matter how much it may just seem to be your habitual way of thinking got to learn how to drop it, drop it, drop it. Step back from it. Look at it as something separate, simply an event that's conditioned by other events and is going to condition other events down the line. This way you learn how to cut through our ignorance. that keeps us suffering.
as we begin to see the, the different contexts we create about around these events, how they place burdens on us. Either they're actively unskillful, or even when they're relatively skillful. The fact that we have to create these contexts means that we're constantly keeping them alive, keeping them going. If we don't maintain them, they pass away. So you want to learn how to put the mind in a situation where it's totally free from context, simply looking at events as they arise and pass away. This is ultimately right view gets to the point where you'd even see them as existing or non-existing. No sense of self gets built up around them. Even the, even the concept of existence or non-existence doesn't get built up around them. Just pure events. Stress arising, stress passing away. And that's when you learn to see what lies beyond the stress. So we're trying to create a context here in which the mind can get free of contexts. It may st seem strange that we have this double duty, but this is what works. So have a sense of time and place. When is it time to work on keeping the context here as conducive as possible? And one of the times we just drop the context. We all have chores, we all have duties and responsibilities here to some extent. But you have to learn how to wear them lightly. Think about them when things need to be thought about, and otherwise drop them. Just be with the breath, just you and the breath. And over time there'll be less and less you, and even less and less breath. That's when things get really light. As we see that we don't have to keep maintaining that ignorance. John Sawat once said, ignorance is like darkness, even though the darkness may have existed for aeons. As soon as you light a light, the darkness doesn't have any right to say, okay, I've been here for a longer time. The light doesn't have any right to drive me away. As soon as knowledge arises, it can cut through the ignorance that's been here for so long. So do what you can to give it the chance to arise, this light of knowledge. both as you sit here with your eyes closed and as you go through the rest of the day. <laughs>